Here he goes. So welcome everybody. I think, I don't even remember the title of this, but it's nutritional supplements versus natural medicines. What you should know and why. I think it's something like that. So if this is the lecture that you expected to be at, you're in the right place. Uh, my name is Dr. Karen Duncan. I'm a naturopathic medical doctor here at Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And today we're talking about really the broad, the broad term for it is, is polypharmacy. Um, in most of my community lectures, whether we give them at Pilgrims or whether I'm here or just about every single patient that I see, we end up bringing the conversation back to polypharmacy. What are you taking and why? Um, and what the supplement industry offers and what the downfalls are. And I didn't expect that to be a part of my job at all. In medical school, you know, you, you go to medical school to save lives and enhance people's health. Um, and I didn't realize that so much of my time and energy would be spent educating people on the safety and importance of knowing what they are putting in their body when really and truly they're trying to do the best they can. They're advocating for themselves. Many of my patients are doing their own research, going out and sourcing supplements, going out and sourcing natural medicines under the impression that these things are benign, um, that they will help, that the marketing is accurate and that they don't have any side effect profiles to them. So I'm here really to clarify some of those misconceptions and help educate and empower you to continue doing the advocacy for your own health um, as you continue on. <clears throat> so the very first thing I wanna say is there is a difference between nutritional supplements and natural medicines. And I think defining that difference for people is really the starting point of understanding what's happening in their body and what to expect when they get a natural medicine prescription or whether they're sourcing a nutritional supplement. So some examples of nutritional supplements would be vitamin B12 or iron if for somebody who's a vegan, somebody who doesn't get it in their diet. Um, calcium for somebody diagnosed with osteoporosis. Um, when we have a known deficiency or we know that we're not getting it from our diet or we're unable to absorb it when we do take it, right? B12 being a common one. As we age, we make less intrinsic factor, which is necessary for our body to actually absorb the B12 that we ingest. Sometimes supplementation with that will help the body. And a lot of times it's not even an oral supplementation at that point in time. But all that to say, nutritional supplement is taking what you would be getting in your nutrition that you are not and supplementing that. These tend to be mostly safe. Now I say mostly because not anything, not everything is safe that you put in your body, food grade or otherwise. Vitamin D is another great nutritional supplement. We're not getting enough of it from our sun, especially in the Northern hemisphere with all the time we spend indoors in front of our screens. So we supplement with vitamin D. Now natural medicines are prescriptions. And for the sake of this lecture and for your knowledge moving forward, I would like to be thought of as such. When we prescribe natural medicines, the very first thing I like to tell patients is that most of our synthetic pharmaceuticals are derived from some sort of natural medicine, right? We've got willow bark that had salicylic acid and we made aspirin from that. So a lot of these things are derived from something natural to begin with. And when we start to see that correlation, we understand that the original formula, which is in a botanical sense or a natural sense, if you will, still can have a side effect profile, can still interact with other things in your body, can still cause distress depending on what the diagnosis is. So natural medicine prescriptions should come from a physician. Um, most of the time, that's what we go to school for. That's, that's what we know, especially a naturopathic doctor. We have the research and I'm going to share my screen with you in a little bit. So you can see behind the scenes of what I do for every single one of my patients to ensure safety and efficacy of their natural medicines and their supplements. <clears throat> the other thing that I like to bring to everybody's attention, especially those with a very long list of supplements and that might be better off with some sort of pharmaceutical prescription or might be a little bit more helped by one is I wanna stay natural. I wanna stay as natural as possible. I don't wanna take any of that. And when you look at the ingredients in your natural supplement or your natural medicine, and then you think about, we are isolating constituents from plants. We're putting them in a, in a um, what am I thinking of? 
some sort of plant or factory, right? We're isolating them. We're using chemistry to isolate them and then package them and put them in a little capsule. And then they go in the bottle and then they sit on a shelf to be distributed. They may be more natural at origin, but I can guarantee you that is not completely benign, right? Sometimes they have preservatives added into them. Sometimes there's other ingredients. A lot of times, again, as I'm gonna show with you on my shared screen, there are additives in our supplements <clears throat> that don't even have to be put on the label and are often omitted. And so they're adding things to these supplements that they're not even having to display on the label itself. So when we say, I only want natural, what I wanna get across is natural is great. I'm a naturopathic physician. I obviously believe in my medicine, but it's not always benign and it's not safe all the time. So with that being said, I'm gonna pause for a minute for some, some general questions and then I'm gonna share my screen and kind of walk through some of the things that I'm talking about so you can see it. Does anybody have any questions for me kind of right out of the gate? Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And if somebody could just let me know if you can see this. It should be a, a slide from Instagram actually on your screen. Can everybody see that okay? I can see it. Great, thank you. So, talking about credibility here and I open up a social media page. But what I will say is this is a colleague and friend of mine. This is Dr. Mark Heisig. Um, if you are on social media, I strongly recommend you follow this doc, dot his name down. He's phenomenal. He specializes in post-concussion recovery treatment, a lot of functional neurology. And honestly, he posted this five days ago, <laughs> this post, and I was laughing because I was preparing for this lecture. And then he posted this post. It was essentially, hey, I wanted to say that in my lecture. So he did a great job kind of outlining some of this. He puts really great, um, broad medical knowledge out on his pages. He has the time and the um, bandwidth and the ability to do so. Um, so I think it's a really, really good resource to follow if it's something that you're interested in holistic care. Um, because he has a lot of good phenomenal, like I said, information out there um, for everybody to see and have access to. Um, so this is, you know, what he posted. He talks about how drugs and, and, and natural medicines are excreted from the body. That was, you know, the headline of his post because people were saying, why would I even take a, a supplement or a natural medicine? Doesn't it just make expensive urine? And so the first couple of slides were, of course, it makes urine. That's how we excrete everything that we put in our body, either through our urine or our blood or our feces. Um, especially our medicines and supplements, because that's what we do. We metabolize and then we get rid of. So in this slide, what I thought was really pertinent to the conversation we're having today was that the body and the metabolism are dependent on something called enzymes. And those enzymes have cofactors. <clears throat> and this is often the time when we'll turn to a nutritional supplement. Organic cofactors are vitamins or vitamin derivatives. Inorganic are minerals. So, hey, I'm seeing that you're having a deficiency here. We need to um, supply that biochemical reaction with a natural supplement. Maybe it's selenium for your thyroid function. That's something that we see often, right? We have autoimmune thyroiditis, Hashimoto's. We know that it takes selenium to convert T4 into T3. And when we supplement with selenium, we see those autoimmune antibodies go down and we see more effective thyroid function. That would be a, a nutritional supplement for an enzymatic process to happen in the body. The next one is because like I said, when we have these deficiencies, then these enzymes can't function properly. And the downstream effect of that is either buildup or loss of another constituent in your blood. And then it causes symptoms, right? These are the very, when we talk about root causes, naturopaths, this is what we talk about. We get into the biochemistry of what is happening in the body, what's deficient, what's vulnerable, and how can we support that process and its natural existence with either supplementation, and we'll get to natural medicines, but most of the time nutritional supplements to help that body start working again. The second part that I want to mention here, and this goes into a little bit more of the interaction conversation we're going to have, pharmaceutical drugs can lead to vitamin mineral deficiencies 
So when we as naturopaths look at your medication and nutritional supplement or natural medicine list, it's really important for us to be aware of what are the side effects of this? Does this cause malabsorption? Does this compete with absorption for something else? And therefore cause a deficiency, right? A lot of antileptic drugs, anti-seizure medications will cause a depletion in vitamin D and calcium and lead to osteoporosis. So Knowing these interactions down to the biochemistry is really essential for your physician to be aware of, especially if you choose nutritional supplements and natural medicines along with your pharmaceuticals, because those interactions are extremely important. So the last point here that I really like is we, we excrete everything in our pee and poop for the most part, all of our toxins, prescription drugs, um, food, environmental pollutions, pollutants, things like that. Um, we need nutritional supplements a lot of the time when we are depleting them or when we're seeing an enzymatic malfunction. Um, and then the, the quote that I just love about what he put is polypharmacy is polypharmacy, whether it's natural or otherwise. And that's really, I mean, if that could be the broad headline of today, it's that I see so many patients here. And again, it wasn't what I expected in practice that say, I don't do any pharmaceuticals. I'm very proud of myself. I just take this and they will bring in an Excel document with no fewer than 30, 50. I've seen supplements on that list. I'm only taking natural things and I'll run their labs. And guess what I'm seeing? Kidney failure, kidney disease, elevated liver enzymes, still seeing deficiencies in other places because we're not really getting to the source of the problem. So polypharmacy or multiple prescriptions doesn't change in its definition whether or not it's natural or prescription. So I really want to hit that point hard here and we're going to continue to drive that home. <clears throat> The next page I wanted to share with you is actually through NIH, um, National Institutes of Health. This is a study they conducted that's out on PubMed right now about supplementation, the knowledge of what we're taking and how those are influenced out in the marketplace. So I wanted to share, and this is one of many, by the way, but I really wanted to have something incredible to share here that said, over-the-counter nutritional supplements do not need to demonstrate clinical efficacy and are exempt from the FDA. Read that again. <laughs> Take a pause here the next time you go in for your nutritional supplement. Next time you go in and say, oh, I think this is going to benefit me. They don't have to prove that it works and they don't need to prove what's in it. Minimize sales of contaminated products. Some places are requiring third-party testing for the purity and quality of dietary supplement. That doesn't happen all the time where we have third-party companies that go in and actually determine whether or not these supplements are actually maintaining one label potency and two, what they claim to be in there. There's a article or a um, news report from CBS back in 2015 that was saying lab tests determined only 21% of the products actually had DNA from the plants advertised on the labels. Major retailers didn't meet label potency. I mean, this is all over in our news. This is everywhere that you can kind of, in Walmart, 4% of products, right? So I'm not, I'm not trying to hit on this or shame anybody for trying to advocate for the health and do what's right. What I'm trying to say is that there is a way and a strategy to do this. And because these are not regulated by the FDA, which by the way, is not the end all be all, but it's helpful to have a regulatory source on these products that anybody can put anything out there with no repercussions of what they're taking. So when I, when I have this conversation with people who are so self-aware, who are so um, desiring to care for their health and they're eating clean and they're doing you know, everything that they wanna do to maintain health, and yet they're taking these over-the-counter supplements at large doses and large amounts in polypharmacy without the knowledge that they really don't know what's inside it because people don't have to meet the label potency, it can be scary. And it can be really, really uh, rattling to a lot of people. I will say personally, personal only. <laughs> the only place really that I recommend people do not buy their supplementation because I don't want to minimize the fact that it is also hard to source these things to go through the whole um, process of sourcing and making sure that they've gone through a third party site and that not everybody can access a naturopathic doctor is Amazon and eBay. 
Um, anybody can sell. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know how it's been stored. There's been multiple, multiple reports of sawdust even being found inside some of these capsules, um, relabeling, false marketing, false labeling. I mean, you name it, 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 there's studies on it. There's investigations. There's so many things that because we don't have a regulatory agency, there's really no um, guidance on this. There's no repercussions. So in my opinion, I try to avoid those two sourcing places for any natural medicines or nutritional supplements. And while they can be cheaper on the front end, if we're desiring an effect in our body um, to improve our health and wellness, and we're investing any sort of money into something that's subpar or subclinical, subtherapeutic dose, um, then really it's a waste of money where we could have saved up and maybe invested in something that's actually going to have an effect. And a lot of the times in my prescriptive world, it's three months. I'll prescribe something for 30 days, for 90 days and say, here's the desired therapeutic effect. Here's the dose with which we're going to take it. We'll either rerun labs or assess your symptoms at that point in time and we can taper off or discontinue. Um, but this is really important to understand how the prescriptive world works with natural medicines. And it's, it's not that different than the pharmaceutical world, other than some of the some of the end game, some of the, um, what we're prescribing. So do we have any questions about sourcing, about the FDA, about what to expect in an over-the-counter world? Anything that we want to address here before moving forward? I have my chat box open. Okay, no questions. So <clears throat> in every time I see a new patient, I will put on their visit summary, a little blurb about supplementation. And I talk about this is not a regulated um, practice. Here is my commitment to you as your naturopathic doctor. I'm going to screen all the supplements that you're on. I'm gonna make sure they're dosed appropriately. I can run a consumer lab report, and then I'll make sure that we're targeting either your symptoms or your conditions effectively. So now I'm moving from nutritional supplements into natural medicine prescription. If there's nutritional supplement warranted, we have that conversation, here's why, here's how, let's do this, let's run your labs again, right? And make sure that we've replaced that. And while we're at it, let's see why it went deficient in the first place. Is there malabsorption? Is there a bleed somewhere to lead to your anemia? Um, so we, we go through those different things. Is there enough dietary um, resources available to give you the essential nutrients that you need? Now we move into natural medicines. These should be, in my opinion, prescription only. And here's why. Let's say I want to prescribe somebody ginkgo for their memory, or somebody comes into me with a ginkgo supplement. This website is called Consumer Lab. One of the very first things that I do with every patient is I go on a Consumer Lab and I run a report on every supplement that they are on outside of what they've sourced from our clinic. Because what I can say is part of our clinic dispensary, our brick and mortar, is doing this work for everything we carry in house. So while it may seem like a conflict of interest at some point in time that, hey, I'm recommending you get the supplement from me and not somewhere else, it really has nothing to do with the kickback financially that we get. It's really because the amount of time that I'm going to save running a consumer lab report on all these other supplements to find out that a small percentage of them are actually passing is going to benefit both the patient and myself. So in consumer lab reports for Ginkgo, they talk about, yeah, they give me some evidence base. Ginkgo may modestly improve limited aspects of memory and cognition. It also shows stronger evidence indicates no significant benefit in preventing or treating Alzheimer's disease. So it's helpful to have some of those resources when we're saying, hey, I'd like to prescribe this for you. Here's what we can expect from it. Here's the main thing of what I do here. Only four of the 10 popular Ginkgo supplements that they selected were tested for approved. So. Um, this is why, so there's a problem. One product was discovered to contain no more than 3% of its listed amount of ginkgo extract. Some others have been adulterated or spiked with compounds from plants other than ginkgo. 
So they really give you a lot of information and then what to look for in ginkgo supplements. So somebody brings me in their ginkgo supplement. What am I looking for? What is the dosage required to have an effective therapeutic use for it? So we're looking for 25% of flavanol glycosides and 6% terpene lactones. So these are things, right, that the, the labels want to go, woo, we have all this ginkgo in there. We've got all this, what I see all the time, turmeric, right? Turmeric has it all the time. We've got turmeric. We've got all these milligrams of turmeric and you turn it around and I'm looking at the percent curcuminoids. Is it paired with black pepper? Is it actually going to be effective in your body? And these are things, like I said, that I have been trained in and most naturopathic doctors have to really be effective in our prescriptions. So now we look again, side, and, side effects and safety of ginkgo. So that's, that's a small snippet of what we're doing when we look through your supplements. Now, when I scroll down, I can see, here we go, ginkgo supplements. Bulk supplements, not approved. Very little list of ingredient. Here's doctor's best, not approved. Spiked from another source. GNC was approved. So you can, or I can go down here, you can create a consumer lab report and you can see here's what nature made is approved. Believe it or not, right? We sign nature made it at Walmart, Walgreens, things like that all the time. Here's the kicker with brands. Sometimes nature made and now will be approved. Sometimes it won't depending on the supplement. So it's not it's not black and white. It's not clear cut. When some people will come in and say, this is the only supplement brand I use because it's always a good one. I always have to say that's not necessarily true. Here we go. Source Naturals. They have really great formulas for some uh, conditions, not approved for ginkgo. So you can start to see an idea of the process it takes to source high quality natural medicines. It is not as easy as walking in your natural food store or walking in somewhere else and saying, I want this and I'm gonna trust what's on your label. What I can say is that the ones here, if you're in Coeur d'Alene, I think Pilgrim's Market, I think Natural Grocers, I think Super Supplements, they do a phenomenal job of sourcing high quality supplements just like we do here at the clinic. So I do think we have a few resources locally that are really responsible at their sourcing and they have well-educated supplement coaches on their staff. Here's where it becomes a little bit more particular. So as a neuro doc, I hear all the time, I'm taking fish oil. Fish oil is supposed to be good for me, right? I am gonna take fish oil and it's gonna cure all my woes or metabolic issues, right? I have high triglycerides, so I'm gonna take fish oil. This is a, a website for physicians only, so I'm sharing this with you. Um, it's called Natural Medicines. And this is an evidence-based resource for looking at natural medicines, how they interact, how they work. There are multiple websites like this, drugs.com I think is one, for pharmaceuticals, right? Any pharmaceutical that you're prescribed, you can go plug it in this algorithm and they'll say, here's what to take it with, here's not, here's how it works, here's what it does. This is one for natural medicines. So when we talk about fish oil, which will be the example we use for a while here, we're gonna talk about what is it effective for? Elevated triglycerides. That's the one thing that we know it's absolutely effective for. Now, when I scroll down to say what dose is effective, right? Four gram daily dose, triglycerides can be lowered by 20 to 30%. When a two gram dose is used, it's reduced by about half. Now, we already talked about quality. Now we're talking about dosing. Can anybody guess, here's what I'm gonna ask for participation. What is the average amount of milligrams? I'm gonna say people aren't even on gram doses when they come see me. What is the milligram average dose of fish oil that people come in to see me on? Anybody venture a guess? Anybody wanna play along? Five hundred milligrams. The reason is because if you think of your fish oil or you go look at your fish oil bottle, most times on the front it'll say thousand milligrams of omegas. We win. We're the best. We've got a thousand milligrams of omegas. And you turn around that ingredient label and you only look at EPA and DHA, which is the natural medicine part that we're looking for to treat these things, and it's going to be about five hundred to seven hundred milligrams of those two constituents. 
And then you look at the serving size per two capsules, per four capsules sometimes, right? Now I'm talking four gram daily dose for triglycerides and you're getting 500 milligrams in four capsules, or let's just say two capsules. That's eight a day. And how big are fish oil capsules? So like, they're huge, right? These are monstrosities. So now we're taking eight big horse capsules to get four grams of our daily dose and only 60 come in the bottle. And so you're spending how much money for maybe a week or two dosage amount to get what you needed. And we haven't even gone into the consumer lab report yet to make sure that it's responsibly sourced and we don't have any other spike measures in there. We don't have any additives. We don't have any preservatives. And the place that you store it from kept it refrigerated. So there's a lot of things that we need to understand about this fish oil that you're taking for this cause to make sure that it's working. And what happens more often than not is that's what happens. There are sub-therapeutic doses of supplements that have not been proven to be quality products. And then when they don't work, people just go, ugh, natural medicine doesn't work. Why would I even do this? It's just expensive urine. So what I want to help say is it does matter and it does work a lot of the time, but it is a science. It's just like pharmaceutical medication. This is a science. There is a lot of evidence behind the natural medicines that we prescribe. Now let's take this fish oil here at a four gram daily dose and it starts working for you and your triglycerides come down and your cousin's brother's son fiance comes to you and says, I have high triglycerides too. Can I try fish oil? And you say, yeah, it works for me. It's going to work for you. And you give them all the information you have. What don't you know about that person? You don't know their medication list. Look at all the interactions that fish oil has with drugs. Anticoagulants, antihypertensives, contraceptives. Look at this list, a lot of them. Look at the list of supplements that it interacts with. So when we think that we can just willy nilly give the supplement or natural medicine that worked for us to somebody else, we can actually cause a lot of harm. And I see this a lot in my practice. Hey, this works for me, can I give it to my husband? This works to me, can I give it to my neighbor? And I can tell you the answer is no. And in my practice, it's not only no, it's hell no, please don't do that. And it's not because I wanna gain a new patient or because I don't want you to share what you know, it's because it can cause harm. These are prescriptive natural medicines. Here's the other thing that makes it not benign, right? There's some adverse effects to taking something as simple as you would think of fish oil. Rash, nausea, loose stools. You can actually have an increase in your LDL cholesterol levels, right? So somebody has high cholesterol, but they also have high triglycerides and they decide, well, I'm going to give it a shot and they make that worse. AFib, immune suppression, risk of bleeding. So there's, there's really a lot that I investigate with each patient and every physician will investigate with each patient before making these prescriptions that is necessary to do so responsibly. Um, I don't know what I was looking for on this page. This just shows a bunch of different um, conditions that it could be effective for and what studies are behind it. So I tell people a lot of time, hey, I have some studies that show this might work for you. I think it's worth giving it a shot. Um, and then we go through that process of, hey, this is the studies. You seem to fit here. We don't have any adverse effects. We're not interacting with anything else. Let's give it a shot and see if it works for you. Um, so this helps guide some of those clinical decision-making um, processes that we go through behind the scenes. Now, we talk a little bit about, yeah, we don't want to give fish oil to people on blood thinners. We don't want people who are getting ready for surgery to be on fish oil. Somebody with a high LDL, we don't want to, right? There's, there's that kind of interaction that, while not safe, may not be life-threatening. Here's one, St. John's work, commonly prescribed for depressed mood, low mood. 
And I want you to see in the red here, some of the drug interactions that happens when you take St. John's wort. St. John's wort is what we call a P450 enhancer. It induces an enzyme in your liver that metabolizes other medication. So if you've ever heard, don't drink grapefruit juice when you take your meds, right? It's an old wives tale that actually has a lot of <laughs> knowledge behind it. Um, how I always remembered it through med school is that a grapefruit is a big old ball and it sits in your liver and it blocks its ability to metabolize things. So we increase the blood concentration of our other medications with grapefruit juice, which can be dangerous. St. John's wort works the opposite way. And I always remember that if you take St. John's wort with your birth control, you're going to get pregnant because what it does is it enhances or induces the enzymatic approach of metabolism in the liver of other P450 drugs or medications or supplements, which there are many of, and it decreases the blood volume or the efficacy of those medications, therefore deeming them ineffective. This is a natural medicine. This is something you can go get over the counter anyway. Hey, for low mood, the marketing's gonna get you. COVID got you down, take some St. John's wort, right? Now I'm gonna take it with my thyroid meds or my contraceptive drugs, or I'm gonna take it with X, Y, and Z. And it's going to make those things ineffective. These are not benign medicines. They are natural. They are not always safe and benign. So we look through these, how many red flags we see with taking something like St. John's wort that's just sold over the counter and recommended by many people out in the world. Hey, you don't feel so good. You got low mood, Let's take some St. John's wort. So that's really, you know, kind of the biggest points that I wanted to drive home with this lecture is I, I, I run into it all of the time in my clinic, polypharmacy. I strongly, strongly advocate for patients advocating for themselves, sourcing out things to better their health, to improve their health, to support their diagnoses. I know that most of my patients are hustlers. They're out there working hard to do better, to be better. And a lot of the times when I say, I will take that from you, let me do that part of the job. I have the resources, I have the access then it, it helps people feel better. It's less taxing on your liver and kidney. It's less taxing on your mental health. And it's done in a responsible prescriptive way. I also understand, like I mentioned earlier, not everybody has access to a naturopathic doctor. So what I would recommend is our clinic and a lot of other clinics actually offer free 15, free consults, free, you know, whatever the case may be, find one, take them up on it. Say, I want a free 15, I'm going to show you my med list. I just want to know if there's any interactions there. Hey, great. If I feel like it's going to take me an hour, I may say, hey, this is going to take me a little bit of time, send it over and we can charge you appropriately for the time. But what I do want to say is it's, it's important to know, it's important to gain knowledge from, to do the research about, and then to understand that natural medicines are different than nutritional supplements and they're different than pharmaceutical medications but not everything is safe, not everything is benign, not everything can be shared with your loved ones or your neighbors or your friends. And that there is indeed so much research and evidence now, especially getting put into this natural medicine world that makes them relatively, like I said, prescriptive in nature and how you take them with another one, with food, with, um, like I said, other medications it matters and it's going to change its efficacy. It's going to change its mechanism of action. Um, it's going to change how we get rid of it, how we excrete it. And I think the last thing that I really wanted to mention, and I say this, phew, I don't know how many times I say it <laughs> in my practice, is if at any point in time, I suspect malabsorption in the body. If you're taking medicines, if you're eating food, if you are ingesting anything, that's only one small part of the rest of the process that has to happen for it to get into your bloodstream. And if we're not digesting and we're not absorbing, or if we have any metabolic dysfunction in the liver or eliminatory dysfunction in our colon through bowels or urinary dysfunction, then I pause and I pause hard and I dig my heels and I say, until those things can be corrected, fixed, supported, it's going to be really, really hard for me to treat you with oral medication, natural medicines, natural nutritional supplements. 
we have to have, our body has to function for any of those that we are taking in orally to be effective in the bloodstream. So the processes by which these go through, the knowledge that we know of, how is it absorbed? How is it digested? Um, what do we need to get it into our bloodstream? And then what do we need to use it from there? And I have a couple minutes left. So some of the examples I'm gonna use is the first one is B12. Some people have what's called a genetic SNP called MTHFR where they cannot methylate their B12. We can take as much oral B12 as we want. We can inject it. We can do anything we want with B12 if it's in the form of cyanocobalamin when it's not methylated and your body says, can't do anything with it. And your doc will run your blood, your blood screen and say, you've got plenty of B12 in your blood. You're doing great. You don't need any more. Actually cut back on your supplementation. And what I see is I'm going to run a homocysteine level on you because that's going to tell me, are you actually using the B12 in your biochemistry the way it should be? And when we can't methylate B12, our homocysteine elevates and an elevated homocysteine can be neurotoxic. And so when we run those further labs, when we investigate nutritional deficiencies to that level, we can actually understand not only are we taking enough, are we absorbing enough, but then are we using that with what's in our bloodstream? So really important to understand all of those different phases. Intrinsic factor, like I mentioned before, if you don't have intrinsic factor, you can take all the B12 you want and you're not even going to absorb it in your bloodstream. You're just going to pee it out. So again, these things are really important. The other nutritional supplement I want to hit on is magnesium. The most common form of magnesium I see people taking for their anxiety is calm, right? Big old bucket of calm magnesium powder. Everybody's got it. Everybody loves it. It's great. Magnesium is chelated in a lot of different forms nutritionally and calm magnesium is magnesium citrate. And believe it or not, magnesium citrate is not well absorbed in the gut and we use it for constipation. We don't want it to be absorbed. It actually acts like an osmotic laxative and helps people have bowel movements regularly. Very little of it is actually absorbed into your system to help with anxiety. And a magnesium glycinate would be more indicated for that end cause. So these conversations that I have so frequently with my patients, I think you're doing a great job. You're hitting all the right pieces here. You're trying to supplement. You're trying to get your B vitamins because you have neuralgia or headaches or you have Parkinson's or you're trying to take your magnesium because you know you have anxiety, but now you're having diarrhea because you're taking this osmotic laxative instead of the magnesium form that's indicated for anxiety. It's, it's important to me that people understand again, what they're putting in their body. And it's an unfortunate truth that the marketing for some of these is, is just going to help calm you down. It's the name of the thing. And while it's one of my favorite supplements for constipation, <laughs> it's not first on my list for anxiety, even though that's what it's marketed to do. The last example I'm going to use is because I have a neurologic focused practice. And in that is specifically focused on Parkinson's disease is how do we intermix nutritional supplements or natural medicines with pharmaceutical medications? Most of my people with Parkinson's don't know or have never been told that one, it takes hydrochloric acid to even absorb, to digest your medication so it can be absorbed. And many people with Parkinson's are low in hydrochloric acid to begin with. And two, that it competes directly with protein containing food for absorption. So when you're prescribed even a pharmaceutical, knowing how to take it, when to take it, and what to pair it with is really important. So when we start pairing carbidopa levodopa or Cinemet as a brand of Parkinson's medication with high doses of vitamin C for the acidity component, that medic and taking it away from protein rich foods by at least an hour, that medication tends to be more potent and more effective. And what I see is we actually get to cut back the dose little by little to have the same amount or better efficacy in maintaining their symptoms. So again, I, I'm giving all of these examples just to show there's much more to taking either a nutritional supplement or a natural medicine than you might think. Most of the time, a nutritional supplement can be safe, can be warranted if you have reason to believe that you're deficient or you've had somebody explain that to you or you've had somebody understand or coach you through how to take it, what to expect. Natural medicines should be prescriptive. They are not always safe. They are not always benign. They can be extremely effective. They can be extremely destructive when not used appropriately and they are not to be shared 
like I said, with your cousin's brother's fiance. I don't remember who the lineage was there, but <laughs> you get the point here with your, with your neighbor. So I really want to come across in a very clear way to say, it's a really tough situation. We don't have a, a monitoring facility at this point in time. And it takes a lot of legwork for a naturopathic doctor to responsibly source and prescribe uh, these natural medicines to make sure that they're effective. So we've got a couple of minutes here. I would love and appreciate a couple of questions. Like I said, this is going to be recorded. So if you have a question, chances are somebody who's watching it later has the same one and I'm not available to answer it. So please share. And you can unmute yourself if you. I have a question. Oh, I didn't ever start my video. Um, I started taking the vitamin D primarily, I mean, I'm sorry, the fish oil primarily because it said it helped with vitamin D. And I just saw in what you had there that it says that it may help increase vitamin D, but that was kind of my main focus for it was getting a natural source of vitamin D that wasn't, you know, made in a factory. I mean, it went through a factory, but it was just more a natural source. So, right. So you're talking about a fish oil that's paired with vitamin D rather than taking a vitamin D supplement. Right. Yeah, I mean, it depends on, right? If fish oil is indicated for you and it's safe for your health and things like that, then I think that's a totally fair way to say, yeah, I'd like to increase the availability of it in your body, which is, I think, the, the main mechanism for fish oil and vitamin D to be paired. Um, but again, as far as being more natural, I, I really don't feel like a liquid vitamin D or a capsule form of vitamin D is going to be much less natural than something that's paired with fish oil. Um, the one thing that I didn't even mention about fish oil, while that was my main supplement of choice, right, is the sourcing. I think I maybe hit on it for a second, but like, where are we sourcing it from? What kind of fish are we getting it from? What do those fish eat, right? What's the environment? Are they farmed? Are they wild? So I don't know, think I'm answering your question quite directly, but there's a lot of times we have really, really good intentions of saying, I'm going to do this because it's more natural or it's better, or it's going to enhance bioavailability. That's a great question to ask your doctor and say, Hey, is this actually true? Does this enhance bioavailability of my vitamin D and am I absorbing it? And is it causing any other deleterious effects on my body or my physiology based on my whole health picture? So I'm out of it right now, so I can't look at the bottle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went to get more from the chiropractor and he didn't have any. Yeah. But I, that's a, that's actually like, I, I try not to eat farm-raised fish, but I hadn't thought about whether the fish were farm-raised and just being fed, you know, corn and grains in an unnatural environment. And then we're basically just taking the liver oil. Right. right? That's yeah. How feel. It's tough. I mean, those, like I said, that's, that's a lot of how I spend my time and my job, which, which is an unexpected perk, <laughs> I'll say, um, funnily enough, uh, but it's really important to me. And it's important to a lot of my colleagues to say, you know, where are we sourcing this? There's some herbs out there. I had the honor of precepting actually under Dr. Eric Yarnell, and he's literally written the naturopathic textbook on neurology and gastroenterology, phenomenal research evidence-based guy. And we have all this evidence for some specific herbs and their efficacy, um, but they're being harvested you know, in mass amounts. And he puts down the guidance, like here are your alternatives in order to save these plants and their existence on earth. So when we, when we go into this field of medicine and so many of my patients, which I appreciate are so conscious of their health, of the environment of, you know, public service of all of these things. When we recognize it, there is a lot that goes into how we choose our medicines because we're not using a synthetic lab right? We're, we're harvesting these things. It's, I could do a whole nother lecture on essential oils and, and how, you know, detrimental they are to the environment and to the plants, but I don't have time for that today. So it's a great question. It's a great question to ask who you're sourcing it from. And it's a great question to ask your doctor, say, Hey, here's the brand that I have. What do you think of it? What do you, what, what should I dose it at? And is this actually helping, you know, the bioavailability of my vitamin D? Good question. Anybody else have a question? I guess my my second one, if nobody else has one, is magnesium flakes in a bath. Mm -hmm. That's not a pretty good way to get magnesium, or is it not? 
super beneficial. To what end? Well, just instead to, of, yeah, if you don't have to answer. You have your own magnesium in your body, if you just have, because I have uh, like just flakes from a seabed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can be really effective. Get, it depends on what form it's in, right? But yes, it's going to be absorbed through your skin. It's going to get into your bloodstream. It's not quite as bioavailable as taking it orally um, or, you know, our liquid form or orally or something like that. Um, but typically I'll prescribe magnesium in a bath for muscle cramps, right? To soothe the skin for detoxification purposes. So they work in a different pathway when we do something topically than when we do it orally. So yes, it will get there. It will get there more slowly um, and not quite as, as potently. A lot of times when I prescribe a nutritional supplement, again, if I'm trying to fulfill an enzymatic pathway, magnesium is a cofactor for, oh my gosh, a broad spectrum of, of pathways in our body. And then I'll dose at what's called super physiologic, right? Because we're using it all the time. So think of your checking account, your savings account. I want to get enough in there to support that checking account spending that your body is going through all the time. And I wanna get enough in there that we can dump a little bit into savings that we can use it when we need it. And most of the time when there's a deficiency, think of iron, right? We have an iron deficiency and then our ferritin is completely tanked. To get that built back up takes a long time because we're burning through our checking account but we've got nothing left in the savings. So if you're looking for general maintenance of, of mineral repletion, then absolutely, I think that would be fine. If you think there's a, like a deficiency in a biochemical cofactor state, then I would say it'd probably be worth looking into more of a super physiologic dose to enhance absorption and efficacy down the road. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. And even that, so I just to full circle that, right? Magnesium, safe or unsafe? Have we learned? Well, it it's depends. Like, works like, a, like it gives you like diarrhea, right? <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> that one. It could, but it depends. Somebody with cardiovascular disease, it could actually be very unsafe. It could be indicated for cardiovascular disease for some reasons, and it could be actually unsafe in some diagnoses of heart conditions. So even as something as simple and benign as you think, ah, I just need a little magnesium. Yeah, kidney failure and you're gonna take electrolytes in your water, <sighs> not safe, right? I mean, these are simple things and I'm not here to like instill fear. I'm here to empower you to say, what am I putting in my body? And can my body handle it? Does it need it? Can it filter it? Can I excrete it? Can I actually use it? And how can I find a little bit more guidance on this? Because it is not always safe. Um, not always effective. Sometimes it's the best thing for you and people nail it. And all the and I will end that. Like I get people who nail their supplement list and their med list and they come in and they're like, here's what I'm doing. Here's my plan. Here's my research. I run consumer lab reports and everything they've got. I'm like, boom, keep it going. I'm here to support you. Most of the time, what I actually end up doing is taking away. Let's take this away. You're not even at a therapeutic dose for it. There's no possible way it could be having an impact on your body other than your liver and kidney having to filter it out. Let's take this away. Let's take this away. Oh, you're having this symptom. Let's try this natural medicine or nutritional supplement to help with that pathway, with that disease process, with your inflammatory process and start working through that together to create a supplement or a natural medicine list that's targeted for your individual health. And that's really the end goal of, of what I do here, what we do here. <laughs> so... That's all the time I have for today. As always, emails are appreciated. Info at CDA Healing Arts is the best way to get in touch with me. Put attention, Karen. Um, send me your messages, send me questions. And if you like the video, once it's up on the website, share it with your friends if you feel like it's something people would benefit from. Um, and then stay tuned next, next month, Dr. Hunter will have another lecture. And I don't actually know the topic, but he always does some good ones. So appreciate you all being here. Have a wonderful holiday season and take good care. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs>